wonderful to see you all here today and um, such a wonderful introduction from Herman and Nick um, and I hope you're going to enjoy what I'm going to talk about today which is my passion it's not my work it's my passion I've been doing this for 13 years um, my name is Dr Pauline Dixon I'm from Newcastle University I'm a reader in international development and education and as I say I've been doing this for 13 years when I met uh, Connie and Herman uh, at, in Liechtenstein, I knew how passionate they were about free markets, how passionate they are about South Africa. So as soon as I got this invite to get this fantastic award, which, you know, I have to, my lip starts to quiver when I feel so proud that people are recognising um, what we're trying to do. But these awards are for the kids, it's for the, it's for the entrepreneurs, and it's for the teachers that I've I've come to love and, and come to see in my travels and I'm just so lucky to be here to get that award for them. <laughs> and I knew I was going to go. <laughs> um, but what I'm going to do is to help you envisage what I see when I'm around the world. I've got a, a little um, video, it's about two or three minutes of some of the children and some of the schools so you can actually see um, what I'm talking about. The images go quite quickly, nobody likes this video apart from me. It's got a little bit of music to it, I'm, I promise not to dance, especially not with Herman and Connie. Um, but I hope you like it, but at least you get to see what some of these schools are like. myself. As I say, it's a, it's a great privilege to be here today and to share my experiences and the research that I've been doing over the last 13 years, especially at the Free Market Foundation. I've been a fan of Leon Lowe and Eustace Davis for many years, and I know that they inspired Professor James Tooley as well to look at low-cost private schools around the world. And as I say, as soon as I met Nick and Terry and Brian and all the other people and, and Terence, what a fantastic job they're doing for, to help freedom, economic freedom and liberty uh, here in South Africa. <coughs> when I go to a, a slum area or a low income area, I see all that is good. I see pictures like this. I took this picture in Hyderabad about five years ago. And I took it because of the vibrancy of this situation. It, it en engendered to me the competitiveness of the markets in this slum area. The, the vibrancy, the colour. People weren't sitting around waiting for governments to do something for them. They don't read World Bank reports. They're getting on and doing things for themselves because they have to. Somebody isn't going to come and help them. They're doing things for themselves. And I was really pleased when I got this picture home because I put it on my laptop. And right in the top there, this is uh, again at Hyderabad in India, there's a signboard and it's for a low cost private school, Galaxy School English Medium. These signboards are all over India because there's much competition between the schools there. We received a grant in 2003 from the Sir John Templeton Foundation to look at how children were being educated in slum areas around the world. We actually got a million dollars from the John Templeton Foundation. So we went into slum areas and shanty towns in Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, India and China 
Most recently, we've looked at Sierra Leone, South Sudan, and Liberia, because nobody knows how children are being schooled in shanty towns and slums, and they wanted us to find out. So we looked at three questions. Really, it's the accepted wisdom that private schools are for the privileged or for the elite. Everybody else needs free government schools. So we wanted to look at that aspect first. The second one is that free government schools are the only way that poor, the poor can access education. And the third one was, if there are these low-cost private schools, then they must be of low quality. And that's fine. People have got their own philosophical baggage. But you need to do gold standard research in order to find out. We can all dismiss low quality. We can all dismiss things because that's what we perceive. But unless you do the research, you actually can't find out the truth. So we wanted to find out the truth. At first, when we went to countries, this is Kibera in Kenya, the largest slum in East Africa, the size of Central Park. When we arrived in Kenya, James Shikwati said to us, I don't know why you've come to Kenya. There are no low-cost private schools here. Actually, later on in the presentation, we found 76 low-cost private schools in this slum area. And it's just that people don't know. So at first, it was a, a bit dispiriting. We thought that we might not find any schools. So what we had to do is go in search of schools. If we found them, what did they look like and what were they actually doing there? We were interested in government schools and low-cost private schools. There are low-cost private schools called unrecognised or unregistered, and they don't appear on anybody's list. So what we had to do, we had to draw maps of the slum areas. There wasn't any GPS at the time, there's GPS now. We drew maps of the slum areas, and myself, James Tooley, and our research teams wandered around every single alleyway, and every time we got to a school, we plotted that school on the map. We had different colours for different school management types. Once we found and located a school, we'd go into the school and ask them questions to find out about the number of boys and girls, the fees, what the teacher's qualifications were, and so on. So that's initially what we did. We were interested in schools charging perhaps five to ten dollars per month, which is about six to ten percent of minimum wage. So what did we find? Well, these are the numbers for Hyderabad in India. That's in southern India. This is three zones, just three zones. There are nine zones in the city. These are the low-income zones, and we just looked at the slum areas in these zones. Charminar, Bandaguda, and Badapura. 19 square miles of this city, we found 918 schools, of which 60% were private. And you can see there are these unrecognized private schools, 335 of them. These do not appear on any government list. These are unregistered or unrecognized private schools. So 60% of the schools in poor parts of Hyderabad are private. Of the quarter of a million of children going to these 918 schools, 65% are going to low-cost private schools, which was an amazing, astonishing finding. Most recently, we've done work in Patna, in Bihar, which is one of the poorest states in India. We were told there were 84 private schools, we found 1,224. So it's a matter of going to these slum areas and looking for these schools, because they're not going to appear on anybody's list. So in Patna, in Bihar, we found 78% of schools are private, 64% of children are going to these low-cost private schools. Similar findings in Africa, in Gar, in Ghana, which is the peri-urban area around Accra, where half a million of inhabitants, 70% of which live on below or less than a dollar a day, we found 779 schools. Again, 75% are private, 65% of the kids are going to these private schools. Similar findings every single country that we've been to. In Lagos State, in Nigeria, Surinale, Kosofi, and Badagri, we found 540 schools, 56% are private, and 75% of pupils are going to these low-cost private schools. The Department for International Development have repeated our work in Lagos, and they have found exactly the same. So our research is very valid and very reliable. Post-conflict zones is our most recent research. <coughs> 1,006 schools we found in Sierra Leone, Western Area Freetown, only 111 were government, all the rest are private. And you'd probably expect that in a post-conflict zone, but there are many low-cost private schools in these post-conflict zones. So, what does our findings show? Our findings show that private education for the poor forms a majority of provision for, for, for poor families. And as I was saying earlier to our newspaper colleagues, the official figures drastically underestimate enrollment. 
So education for all would be much easier to achieve because we've got all of these unrecognized schools that the, the governments don't know these children are going to school because they're going to these schools that are unrecognized and unregistered. So that's a good news story. You might be thinking, that, well, is that a good news story? But it is, because these children are getting some kind of education when the government think that they're actually out of school. So it's a very good news story. When we look at South Africa, the um, Center for Development and Enterprise have actually done some work on low-cost private schools here in South Africa. And they have a, a document called Hidden Assets, South Africans Low-Fee Private Schools. And they were inspired by the work of myself and James Tooley. And in six areas of Limpopo, Gatang, and Eastern Cape, they found 83 low-cost private schools. So these schools actually do exist here in South Africa. 31% of the schools that they found in these areas then are private. So this is a phenomenon that exists in South Africa as well. As you can see, they said that the maximum annual fee in these low-cost private schools was 7,500 rand, and the least expensive was 2,500 per annum. So the first assumption was there were these low-cost private schools. That's what our research shows. The second one is that, obviously, poor children need free primary education. So we wanted to investigate that. So what we did was we looked at Kenya in 2003, Free, free, it's hard to say three and free at the same time. Free primary education was introduced in 2003. The World Bank gave $55 million, the largest grant ever, to Kenya to try to help them with free primary education. Bill Clinton, the former president of America, said, the person we would most like to meet is the president of Kenya because he's helped so many children access schooling. So we wanted to actually question that and to see if that actually was the truth. So in 2003, we wandered around the slum of Kibera, and we found 76 private primary and secondary schools with about 12,000 kids in it. And this is one of them, this is called Mashamoni Squatters School because they're obviously squatting here in Kibera. So, was introducing free primary school a quick win or not? So you've got 76 private schools in Kibera. Kibera is in a bit of a dip, and you've got five government schools around the top of Kibera. If you read Oxfam and UNESCO reports, they say that the enrolment in the government schools increased by 3,296. Great, so that's 3,296 kids in school. Across the country, if you read UNESCO reports, they say that 1.2 million more kids were in school. However, they didn't know they were in low-cost private schools beforehand. So, we asked the schools and the parents in Kibera about their uh, enrolment rates. The 76 schools that still existed in Kibera told us that about 90 to 80 kids in each school had disappeared and gone to the government school. So they lost their enrolment by about 6,000 kids. Schools closed down in Kibera because of free primary education, because children went off to access free government schooling. So the schools that we verified had closed down lost 4,600 students. So if you think 3,296 kids were going to the government schools, we've lost 7,875 kids. And even if that's an overestimate, there were still kids who were initially going to low-cost private schools and because of free primary education have disappeared out of the system somewhere. One of the reasons could be because these schools grow organically out of their own communities. They are run by people from their communities. These aren't schools ripping off the poor. These aren't fly-by-night schools. These schools have been there for years. And once they started closing down, then parents said, well, we're not going to send them to the government schools. The government schools are very posh. And these children were much more used to going to the uh, schools within their own communities. So we went back in 2008 to see what had happened, to see if now there were no low-cost private schools in Kibera. And to our surprise, in 2008, there were more low-cost private schools than before. We found 116 of them. And now 27, or about 28,000 kids were going to these schools. So why in Kibera, and this is one of the schools there in Kibera, why was there no crowding out? Well, we asked the, uh, um, the school entrepreneurs and the teachers why they thought that the kids came back to the low-cost private schools when it was free to go to government schools. 
And this is what one of the head teachers said. When the government initiated free primary education, few children ran away. And after six months, they started coming back again after realising that the standard of education in the government is very low due to the high rates of enrolment, lack of teachers' congestion, and the lack of sitting and learning materials. Now my school is full again. I allow the following flexible admission criteria. Age is not a determining factor. Uniform is not a rule. Parents participate in major issues at the school. We have a child-friendly approach. There is extra coaching for slow learners at free cost. We carry out home visits following up children in the community. And finally, the introduction of free primary education offered the enrolment of students in the school, where many students ran to free government schools, after which they realised that teaching in free government schools was not all that good. They came back. And what we have to remember is that free primary education in a government school doesn't necessarily mean it's free. You have to buy a uniform, you have to buy socks, you have to buy shoes, you have to buy wellies, you have to buy maybe a hockey stick, you have to buy your books, you have to belong to a parent association, PA association. So it's not free. It's advertised as free. Just because you're not paying a monthly fee doesn't mean to say it's free. So what the parents worked out was, although it was advertised as free, it was probably less expensive to go to one of their low-cost private schools run by the communities themselves, they didn't have to travel outside of their own community because they didn't have to have a uniform, they didn't have to have certain things. So parents and children in Cabrera, and this is another school here, I think it's called the River of Life, it had just rained and the little kids were all in their little uh, wellies and everything, but they disagree that government schools are the best way forward. They really like the accountability that paying that fee gives to them. The parents like that accountability and they feel they can go and complain. <coughs> and there's so much competition that they can move schools. They don't have to stay, stick in one school. If that school is failing that children, they can move to a no, another low-cost private school. So if you read um, reports from UNESCO, maybe they say, well, these schools are of low quality. We should close them down because they're low quality. But you know, parents want the best for their children. If you're an illiterate parent from a slum area, you love your kids, you still want the best for them. So it's all very well. This is Mary, who's an education advisor from Nigeria. These are her quotes about uh, children and parents who access Lucas private schools. She'd never actually been to Makoko, which I'll show you in a minute, but these were her quotes. It's the assumption that these schools are low quality. She says that parents send their children to low cost private schools because they are ignoramuses. She says they're a fake status symbol. She believes that private schools are the good, the bad, and the very ugly. She also believes that ill-equipped, unapprovable private schools are causing a lot of damage. Generations wasted. She actually said that children come out half-baked. And this is Professor James Tooley here doing a news night, one of our BBC television programmes, talking about low-cost private schools in Lagos. You can't really talk on those terms about parents being ignoramuses, the quality is low, children come out half-baked if you don't do the research. If she wants to say that, she needs to back it up with research. So that's what we wanted to do. We talked to parents, we did a survey of inputs, and we did a survey of achievement to find out the quality of these low-cost private schools and comparing them to the free government alternative. So what do the parents think? Well, they think that because the teachers are accountable to them, because they're paying a fee, because they can leave the school, because the teachers can get fired and not in a teacher union, they believe that the teachers are more dedicated, the teachers are from the communities themselves. These teachers don't have a trained teacher certificate. They might have a, a degree, or they might be a mum who can read English, but they're passionate, they're passionate about the kids, as I say, they're from the communities themselves. But the parents believe that these are teachers and the school owners are accountable to them. They pay a fee so they can go and complain. They can look at their children's books and they, they see how many times they're marked. In Kibera, when the parents were um, not very happy about the government schools, they felt they couldn't go and complain. It was given to them for free. And the teachers there didn't belong to the same community, so they felt alienated. One uh, parent said, if you are offered free fruit and vegetables at the market, you know they will be rotten. If you want fresh produce, then you have to pay for it. That sounds like something Herman would say, I think. It wasn't Herman, by the way. Um, so survey of inputs. We went round into every school that we found, thousands and thousands of schools, and we looked at blackboard provision, whether they had desks and chairs, whether they provided a library, whether they had a fan. And in all instances, the only thing that the low-cost private schools didn't do as well as was with, um, was with the playground, because they couldn't afford a 40-square-metre playground, because they're often in urban areas and built-up areas. But class sizes in low-cost private schools are much smaller. The activity of the teachers 
is much more active in low-cost private schools. This is in Nigeria. This is from the BBC television programme. This is a sleeping teacher in a government school in Nigeria. He didn't even wake up when the BBC crew came in. <laughs> and actually the children sang, welcome to you, BBC crew, and he still didn't wake up. So. But then the BBC actually began to think about what we were talking about. You know, we're not doing this we're doing this based on gold standard research from one of the best universities in the world. As you can see here in Lagos State, um, when we called unannounced into a classroom, 67% of the government school teachers were teaching, 25% were chatting or in the staff room when they were supposed to be teaching and 8% absent. Whereas in the low cost private schools, 80, 88% were teaching, a few were not teaching and very few absent. So in every country that we went to, low cost private schools teachers are much more likely to be teaching when you call unannounced and you mark down what the teachers are doing. We've done that in thousands of schools. In order to see how the children are doing in their outcomes, we've actually tested 4,000 children in every country that we've been to. So we've now tested, we're now the experts on this, 32,000 children around the world. Um, in Africa, India, and China. And what we do is we give them a maths and English and maybe another language test, but we also give them an IQ test, which is called the Raven's IQ test, to test for innate ability, and we gather data on their family background. Because you can't just compare their raw scores, because that wouldn't be fair, because you could say, well, maybe the children going to low-cost private schools are, are, have a, a higher intelligence or they've got a better background. So what you do is you actually control for that using statistical methods called the Heckman Lee two-step procedure or multi-level modeling. And we've had other people analyze our data as well. These are the raw scores at the moment. And you can see that the sort of creamy color of the children is an average child in the average low-cost recognized school. The purple is an average child in the unrecognized private school. And the purple is an average child, their average school in a government school. And in every country, apart from China, in every country in Africa and in India, it's always this shape. The kids in low-cost private schools are outperforming the kids in government schools. Other work has been done by a lady called Gita Kingdom. She's from Oxford University, and she's found that children in India are a year ahead in low-cost private schools. In Pakistan, they've also done some research with the LEAPS project, and they found that children in private schools are one and a half to two and a half years ahead of these uh, kids in government schools. Private schools serve boys and girls, so just as many girls seem to go as boys, and the, uh, these school fees are about 6 to 10% of minimum wage. So an auto rickshaw driver's uh, wages or somebody uh, on a building site, for example. The teachers in low-cost private schools get about a quarter of the wage of government school teachers. Teachers in private schools are typically not um, recognized by the government and they don't have a teacher training certificate, but they, as I say, they might have a bachelor's degree and so on. I hope I'm not whizzing around and around on this. But teachers in uh, private schools have about a quarter of the wages of, of teachers in government schools. This is Makoko. This is the um, slum area built on stilts in Lagos State. And every time we drove across uh, this bridge to get to the posher side of town, James Tooley and I would say, we want to see if there's any schools in this place. And nobody would take us. The, the taxi drivers were too frightened to take us in. But one of the times, the taxi driver said, well, I'm actually from Makoko. I'll take you in. And we wanted to see how many schools there were on this. It's called the Lagos Lagoon. It's, it's owned by the University of Abad, and These are all squatters here. And we wanted to see how many um, schools there were. And this is where my bag got lost by KLM. I didn't have any clothes. Um, well, I had the clothes that I traveled in, which were pretty much like the ones I have on now. And I had very high heels on. And <laughs> this is built on stilts and very narrow planks of wood. So there's me tottering around, looking in the slum area for low-cost private schools. And all of a sudden, actually his name was David, I remembered. A little boy held my hand. And he said, I'll help you through this slum area. And he did. Yeah. Anyway, um, you know, these kids are fab and you have, you know. Anyway. <clears throat> so he, he took us to this school, which is Kennedy Private School. And I said last night, um, <coughs> These kids were shouting out, Jawohl, Jawohl. And I thought some German film crew had been there. I thought, we're not the first people to come to Makoko. And actually, in Nigeria, it means white man. So all these kids were waving at us. Um, and the little girl called Sandra and David, I said, which school do you go to? And they said, Kennedy, Kennedy. And I, I said, what, President Kennedy? And they're thinking, what is she talking about? And then we got to the school, and it was Ken Addy. 
Kenadi private school, which I think in, in, uh, means uh, three kings or two kings. And it was owned by this guy, BSC. He started it in 1989. Um, such a smashing little school. But as I was saying to the newspaper earlier today, you know, there's lots of philanthropy from within. We found in a sample of 13 schools in this, th th these ladies are doing fish and everything. Um, they give free places away and they give concessionary places as well. This is Andrew Mitchell. He was the Minister for International Development um, from England. And he'd heard so much about our work that he actually went to Kennedy Private School. And he visited BSC here. And he's actually in Kennedy Private School after reading it in James Tooley's The Beautiful Tree. So we've had ministers then going around trying to see what we're actually talking about. And until you actually experience it, you know, it's difficult just to think about it in terms of figures. <coughs> the thing is, though, now we're attracting international aid agencies and governments and as Herman said this market is working really well on its own and it's just something that we've uncovered parents have done it by themselves they've voted with their feet these kids are getting education that they wouldn't get it's nothing to do with us we've just you know, wanted to be a voice and try to protect them and in Nigeria we have protected them because lots of people wanted to close these schools down but because we've shown that they were, the kids were actually doing well and achieving, that's, thank goodness, it stopped closing some of these schools down. Because if you close them down, these kids are going to go to the government school and, and some of them are just going to lose school altogether and they'll never get a route out of poverty. However, international aid agencies are now very interested in this space and maybe they want to start throwing money at it. And I've written a book about this because I'm very concerned that you know, I, I don't want to have a bad influence on something that is such a fantastic phenomenon as um, teaching these wonderful children how to learn. Um, so where does international aid fit into this? Well, economists such as George Aiti believes that the international aid begging bowl leaks. He would say, Africa's begging bowl leaks, it's a bucket full of holes. And he would say, so much so that there are internal leaks in Africa, there's corruption, census civil wars, wasteful military expenditure, capital prices, government waste. He would believe that pouring in more foreign aid actually makes little sense. And here I've just written down some of the alleged aid money thefts over the last couple of years. You know, 25 million in Uganda, given to fund a meeting of Commonwealth heads was stolen by ministers. Down here there's um, textbooks. Uh, 17 million worth of textbooks were lost in Kenya. How can you lose 17 million worth of textbooks? And I hear you've had trouble with textbooks here in South Africa. Maybe there's a textbook thing going on eBay or something, I don't know. But, um, you know, so aid money, unless it's effective and unless it's efficient, it's not going to make a difference. It's no good just throwing money at these schools because they're doing well on their own. Let's not destroy all that is good. At the moment, there is some aid that goes to education. It's about 8% of official development assistance. But aid at the moment really goes to government schools and it goes to achieving what's called education for all. And they're trying to abolish user fees. But abolishing user fees that we've shown actually may not be the best way. They want to increase enrolment. But enrolment, remember, doesn't mean that you actually attend a school. It just means that you, your name's on the list. And even if you're attending a school, if you're not sitting in the class learning, it doesn't mean anything for achievement. So you have to attend a school that is going to provide you some quality and some passion and some teaching. These are some examples of India's begging bowl that leaks for education. There's aid money given to toilets, but there's no water to flush them. 8,000 televisions were given to schools that don't even have electricity, and they were never delivered. $21 million of the Department for International Aid Money was stolen by Indian officials who spent the money on cars. And every year, tens of thousands of dollars are allocated to government schools that don't even exist. So should we be wasting aid money? We don't want to waste it, and we certainly don't want to destroy the low-cost private schools. So what to do? How can we minimize damage to something that's working really well? Well, these are sort of what my summary would be in my book. One, use gold standard research. Don't use planners who think they know best what's for the poor. Oh, yes, we know what's best. Actually, don't do that. Use research to actually um, develop policy. Ask the poor what they want. When I go into a slum area, it's often being said, but nobody ever asked us. When I said to the headmistress in the government school in Kenya, how do you feel about you know, the children from the slum area coming to your school? She said, nobody ever asked me that. Nobody ever asked me how I felt about that. They don't even know that these low-cost private schools exist down there. So ask the poor, ask the people in, in these slum areas and shady towns what they want, and that's called asking the searchers, as William Eastley would say. But we can improve access and quality 
through market-led initiatives and market-based solutions. Let's encourage entrepreneurship, not a dependency. These guys are entrepreneurs already, so why don't we use Herman and people like that to go and help these entrepreneurs to make their schools better, the quality better, and being able to access their schools. Access the schools by vouchers, targeted vouchers. I'm doing some research with ARC, Absolute Return for Kids. We're providing vouchers to 835 kids, about £100 a year to send a child to school, books, uniform and so on. And we're actually doing what's called a randomised controlled trial, um, <coughs> comparing the kids who have got vouchers to compare to kids who don't have vouchers to see if the vouchers make a difference. There's no point in spending millions of pounds on targeted vouchers if they don't work. This is a picture of the vouchers. We're trying to get rid of corruption by putting a, um, a, a little thing here about the kids so they can be swiped. But this is the vouchers for the uniform, and the parents get the vouchers, and then they can spend them in a school of their choice. I hear that there's um, some chains of private schools setting up here in South Africa, and that's one way of doing it. Is it called Con Conu? Sure. Sure. Yeah, yes, so that's, that's the chain. But there are also <coughs> chains of low-cost private schools around the world. There's Amiga chains. Uh, in Ghana and there's also New Globe Academy schools in Kenya and you know chains are, are a good idea because if each individual school is making a surplus then that surplus can go back to the head office and the head office can invest in curriculum development teacher development and so on and also if a parent sends their children to Amiga schools they know what they're going to get it's like going to any other chain you know the standard of education you're going to get um, helping these schools get loans. A lot of the schools make a profit, but they can't go to a bank to show they make a profit because often it's illegal to make a profit or a surplus. So getting them some sort of microfinance so they can improve their schools. Also looking at the regulations. There's lots of corruption and bribery goes on for these schools to get recognised. So you could use accreditation agencies or actually just allow the market to regulate itself through competition. Oh, yeah. Sorry. The other thing is to help improve the quality of teaching. This is a lady in India, and this is typical of a low-cost private school. They, they teach by ropes. I'm just going to go back and then click on her again in case she didn't do it. And you can see that this is typical, 45 minutes of this, to enable the children to learn. They're not reading, they're just reciting. And they do this reciting because in the exams it says, I'm not gonna, from where do we get more? We get more from, we know from last night, it's sheep. Uh, but in the exam it will say sheep and they just have to fill in the blank. But this is a lady teaching in, in India, and we could do something to really help maybe improve the quality of this teaching. Oh, Sheep right, I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's a one method. I'm not saying it's the wrong method, but I'm saying in order to pass the exams, that's the sort of lessons that they sit through day in, day out. And I've been trying to do some different pedagogies in <coughs> India, doing peer teaching, identify children who could be leaders, and then they peer teach other children. This is in a Gurdwadia in the Punjab. And these children are teaching the other children how to read using phonics. So it's trying different methods. They used to use peer teaching in India in the 18th and 19th century before the British came and imposed a government system. So this is really just trying something that India was doing before the British imposed their government system. Also I've been doing something called Jolly Phonics with the kids and just trying to get the teachers to be a little bit more um, inventive in their teaching methods. Not just standing at the front but actually coming down to the children and, and holding the kids. I've, I've been where kids actually have never been picked up before and the teachers never thought about going to the child. So it's just trying to give them different methods and this is them doing phonics and this is a guy doing, uh, uh, Dr. Steve Humble, doing um, magic maths, using magic and using outdoor maths just to try to stimulate maths as opposed to learning maths by rote. As I say, to, to get this award from the Free Market Foundation is a highlight. It must be the highlight of my career. I'm not going to say much more because I'll start again. Um, and, you know, it's not for me. It's for these entrepreneurs. It's for these kids. It's for these teachers who day in, day out do this to try to, to get these kids somewhere and a route out of poverty. 
Um, but B schools are something that should be celebrated. You should go away from hopefully my talk thinking something good is going on in these low income areas and shanty towns around the world. It's a brilliant success story and it's touching millions of poor children's lives around the world. It's giving them a route out of poverty, it's giving them hope and it's allowing them to, to get jobs and become entrepreneurs themselves. But you know, whether we can make a difference through international aid, I'm not sure. But I think, you know, the people here today, you're obviously here because you're interested. People like the Free, Free Market Foundation, um, you know, I think we can actually make it, try and make a difference, try and improve the quality of these schools and make government stand up and realise that these kids are being educated. And I just think that let's do it right. Let's do it together. And I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.